Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be back. Uh, my name is Gregory Q. Jenkins. I'm the founder and CEO of Quintasia Studios. And this is the Quintasia Podcast. Now, I have an honored guest today. You have heard me talk about this individual before. You've heard me talk about Stage 32. Um, you know, I'm very excited. So I'm going to get right to it. Let me give you a little information about our guest today. Um, Anna Henry began her career as a development executive at Nickelodeon before crossing over to primetime television at CBS and ABC in drama development and programming. After freelancing as a creative consultant to production companies, she served as director of development at a boutique literary management and production company representing writers and directors. Anna is currently an independent producer through her company, Idle Hour Entertainment, which develops television projects focusing largely on international and diversity, women, BIPOC, and LGBTQ+, writers, and stories. In addition, Anna is, sought after, is a sought-after script consultant and screenwriting instructor. As a manager and consultant, her clients have worked on shows and set up projects at virtually every broadcast, cable, and streaming television network. Anna teaches writing for television at Stage 32, Loyola, Loyola University Chicago, and UCLA Extension. She's a graduate of USC's School of Cinematic Arts. And, and last but not least, I started my journey at stage 32 by taking her lab class. So this is a person who uh, really kind of opened my eyes to the industry. So it is a pleasure and indeed an honor to welcome you, Anna, to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. So let's. Um, Let's start talking about um, a subject that I think is near and dear to you. Uh, and we'll talk about screenwriting. So in your, in your view, just exactly how important is story structure? What do you think? How, how important is it for a writer to really grasp story structure? Uh, story structure is really the most important thing, or at least it's the bedrock thing. Um, so basically, uh, we compare a lot uh, writing a show or a movie to building a house. Uh, that's not my comparison. That's been around way longer than I've been around. <laughs> um, and structure is the, the foundation, the walls and the roof, right? That's like the structure of a house. You know what I mean? Um, and if you can't get that right, then nothing else matters after that, right? If your walls are crumbling, if the, your house is sliding off the foundation, if the roof is leaking, then, you know, it doesn't matter how well you decorate it. I, I'm not moving in, you know? <laughs> um, so, and that's kind of the basics of becoming a builder, right? If you can't get that part of being a builder, right, then it doesn't matter how good you are at anything else because you're, the thing you're building isn't livable um, in the first place. Um, one of my uh one of the people that I follow on Instagram, Sarah Gamble, who's the showrunner of you, um, among other things, um, uh, posted actually just the other day. She said, I would decorate um a house by vibe, um, but I would build it using a blueprint. And mm -hmm. I love that because that's exactly true. You would deck, you know, you would decorate your your script, you know, your dialogue, your exact descriptions, things like that. Those you would do by vibe, which in in TV and movies we call tone. Actually, it, that's the the sort of the flavor of your project, and that's up to you. Those are creative choices. You would you should still make those creative choices, you know, intentionally uh, with forethought. Um, but if you don't have a blueprint, if you don't have a structure, and you don't build your house with that solid structure, that's then then you're just lost. And actually, if you even if you are writing a sample. 
Uh, if, you know, imagine yourself walking into a sample house that a builder, you know, who's built a development um, has built and you're walking in to see if you might want that builder to build your house and the house is falling apart, the walls are uneven, the floor is slanted, the roof is kind of off and leaking. Would you hire this person to write your, to, to buy, you know, build your house? I think not. So I think that's where your confidence would be shaken right away. So if you can't get story structure right, then it kind of doesn't matter what else you do get right because there's the sense that you can't start from the ground up Hmm. i mean that's very insightful i hope i know that there's a lot of people out there like myself that you know are screenwriters and you know we have people at various different levels uh in their careers but i'm sure we have those that are aspiring screenwriter screenwriters and are not yet produced so that's an important thing um i think that they should know as they start to build their craft that yeah. they should be sure that they're mastering that element. Yeah, I mean, eventually, everything. when you do learn it, eventually it becomes second nature, what the flow is, you know? Um, I mean, I mostly teach, I really just teach television, but it's the same in, in movies. Eventually, it's like second nature. Um, you just know it in your gut. And uh, and then it kind of comes naturally without you just get it right without sort of trying too much the way that I don't know, you would get driving a car right without, you know, paying attention to whether you're hitting the brake or the gas or whatever. <laughs> right. Like you just kind of do it because it's muscle memory. And eventually you also start to see, you know, you've got it when you start to see the structure in anything and everything. If you are if you watch any pilot and the and streaming or otherwise, and you can find the act breaks easily and you see the structure easily, then you got it. Then it's in your blood. Well, definitely. Um, that is something that, you know, I have spent the last few years since taking your class, um, you know, getting better at, because I had never had, you know, I had creative writing classes in high school and stuff like that, but I never really sat down to learn, well, you know, how, and particularly television, how do you write for television? What, what is story structure? What are, um, you know, producers and, or, you know, um, networks looking for in their stories? Uh, and, and why is it that, you know, a well-produced story, or should I say a well-written story, um, you know, they all have the same kind of feel and it's that structure that yeah. because they're all following that that structure. Yeah. And um, you can be very creative within that structure of people sometimes. Well, first of all, by the way, TV pilot structure and film structure are entirely different just because you know one, you don't know the other one because they are very, very different from each other. And um, it is very, it is very, very important to um to learn that and then you can play within that. That's what I was going to say. Sometimes writers tell me that they're worried that things will become formulaic, that if they follow the formula, then things will be, you know, then things will be very formulaic and can't we get creative? And the answer to that is you can get creative within that formula. Sure. And the pilots that I use to teach pilot structure are recent, they are Emmy winning. They are, you know, I tell people that one of the pilots that I love to teach from because it's so like paint by numbers, the structure is so obvious, um, is the Ozark pilot. Tell me Ozark mm. is not creative, right? Like really, that's, you know what I mean? Like argue that for me, that, that Ozark to you feels formulaic. I use uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel to teach pilot structure. Mm. Really, that's formulaic? You see what I mean? Right. You're playing within the formula. You, If you know the formula, then you you see it, then it's very obvious, but you can sit back and enjoy what they're doing within the formula is very different. Um, it's hard to imagine that Ozark and Marvelous Mrs. Maisel are using the same formula. They're entirely different shows, but they are, in fact, using the exact same structure. Right. And that's what I, I you know, I. Even I used to be one of those people who worried about, oh, but it's going to look, they're all going to look the same. But when you see, like, it's funny you mentioned the Ozarks. That's one of my favorite shows ever. I mean, I I just thought that that was just, uh, one, I'm a fan of Jason Bateman. So right there, uh, they have, but it was just very well written, very well acted. You know, it, it was just a, a masterful show. Uh, let me let me pivot to another area that, um you know, I I kind of think it is important, and and believe it or not, I've had some discussions with other writers and whatnot, and 
there were varying opinions on this subject, but uh, since this is an area of your expertise, I will ask you this. So can you, for the purpose of our audience, can you explain what an inciting incident is? And then in your opinion, do you always need to show it in your story? To the, does the audience actually need to see the inciting incident? Right. So, I mean, very, very basically, the inciting incident is the start of your story. If you don't have an inciting incident, then you don't have a start to your story, in which case I don't see how you can have a middle or an end. Uh, so that's sort of the, you know, where I'm coming from. You have to have a start to your story, be that a feature or a TV. And again, I teach TV a lot more and it's a little bit different. Um you have to, first of all, justify why we're starting today as opposed to yesterday or tomorrow, right? Why does the story begin now? And that's really the first part of your, your, your inciting incident in both has kind of two parts. And the first part is something that happens that changes the reality of, of the world for your main character or characters, right? That is the, the start. That's the justification for why we're beginning the story today at this moment, as opposed to some other time. Um, and then, but it has to have a second part because if there's no second part, then everything after that falls apart, which is that your characters have to respond to that by setting themselves a new goal. And they're going to be pursuing that new goal for the duration of your film um, or for the duration of your pilot. In this part, the two are, are exactly the same. If they're not pursuing a goal, that means that your story is not driven by the characters. They are not the ones making decisions. They're not the ones driving the story. We're not actually following them. Instead, it's driven by you, the writer, right? And the audience can feel that. Like you're the one, you know, contriving everything. What's more, it's going to be actually really difficult to write because it's going to be on you to contrive somehow everything instead of allowing your characters to do the hard work and make decisions and go where they want to go. But how do we know where they want to go? Well, if that's their goal, right? The goal is where they want to go. They may change their goal um, and that's fine, right? They're turning points. They may change how they want to go about getting that goal. But if sort of by the end of the first act, I don't understand why we're starting here, what this character's new goal is. And then also two other things, why that's their goal, what inside them, their motivation, why are they pursuing this goal? What sort of person is this that that's the goal they picked? And then also what's their plan at this moment? Like what journey are we setting out on? Obviously things are not gonna go according to their plan, right? Yeah. Uh, then, well, things would be very boring if they did, but. <laughs> They, you have to have an understanding of where the show or is going or where the movie is going. Otherwise, you can't be on board for the ride if you don't know where we're headed, right? If you've ever gotten on any mode of transportation, don't you get on because you know where the destination is, right? Like, isn't that pretty much why we take transportation, <laughs> you know, in, as a general rule? So yeah. it's the same it's the same thing here. If you don't have that, and those are all the components, we call them all together, the inciting incident, but in reality, it's all of those things put together. Um, and they really need to happen by the end of act one, be that in television or be that in film, the only difference in TV is that because in TV you have multiple storylines, it's never one story, it's at least three, um, that you have to start at least a couple storylines in a uh, pilot. And so you have to have at least two inciting incidents instead of mm -hmm. just one. Or sometimes the same inciting incident can inspire two different characters to two different goals, but you really need to start two storylines. Otherwise you're in trouble and I, we can talk about why, but you will very quickly get into trouble in, in a TV pilot if you don't have multiple storylines. Um, and some movies also have multiple storylines. And as far as showing it or not showing it, I guess here's my point. This is a visual medium, right? Both of them are. They're, right. they're, it's a visual medium we're literally watching, right? This is not a 
podcast that's an audio <laughs> medium, although you are watching me, but you know, you could just be listening to me. Um, this is not a book where we're reading. Um, if you don't show it on screen, then why am I watching? Then what am I watching? I guess that's my question. If I'm not watching these things, then what is it that you want me to be watching? Because these things should be taking up your first act for the most part, right? You there would be a status quo before the story begins, and then there would be the ins- this inciting incident with all its components. If I'm not watching this, then I'm confused what you are showing me. Yeah, I, I mean, that, I mean that this is what I live by. It's um, you know um, to kind of jump on an analogy of um, what you in the class that I attended of yours, what you said. Um, to me, it's like if if I'm going to a restaurant, you know, I have an expectation of what it is that I'm going to eat. I know what kind of cuisine cuisine it is. Yeah, why because, you came <laughs> right, yeah. and why I came because you know there's a menu. I can look at the menu, and so I know. Okay, this is so I'm ready for this, you know. And I think that you know, especially for television, you have to do the. Well, I think the same applies for a film as well. But you have to do the same thing. What What am I about to see? What What is this about? I mean, obviously, you're not going to give me everything in Act One because. <laughs> then why do I need to keep watching? Oh, yeah. But I mean, you have to have some expectation. I mean, really, if you've ever, you know, even in a movie, if you walk into the movie theater and you're thinking that you're going to be watching an action film and it turns out that you walked in and and this is, you know, a screwball comedy, I think there's a decent chance that you'd be like, am I in the right theater? You know, you might be checking your ticket knowing that I walked into the wrong theater. Like, this is not what I I, I really thought, you know, I had trail. I really thought I knew what I was watching. And now this is something else. You might be very frustrated, even if you like screwball comedies, because right. today you had thought this is what I'm going to be given. And now that's not it. And you want to end up in a different theater. And that's ex- exactly what I wanted to do with my TV show, which I'm still developing. Um, and that's what you cautioned me against <laughs> because I was kind of slipping in the fact that, you know, it was a romantic comedy without being straight up about it being a romantic comedy. But I could see how that could be dangerous, you know, how you could lose an audience that way because they're expecting a drama. And then if I, you know, hit them with a romantic comedy instead, I've I've been dishonest with them as about what they were going to see, um, right. and, and that's that's certainly more risky. And um, we have genre blends, right, yes. where we put together two genres, but then we are promising the blend and we deliver that blend, right? right. Like that's it's still the same, you know, the same notion. Right. And and that's why I've changed my approach um, to because uh, that that's where you use the restaurant. You know, with guys me. um i my thing though and i i i've heard how other people do too but i'm um, for tv anyway um i compare television to food uh, a lot and there's a reason for that um which we don't necessarily have to go into of why it's <laughs> but it's very similar the way we consume and advertise um food is very similar to the way that we consume mm. and, and advertise television um they're both consumable goods. Um, if you are coming from the marketing world, you know what that means, meaning we consume it and then we have to buy more, um, you know, like milk or soap. Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, we it's very similar in many ways to, you know, to the way food works. And yeah, it's, it's you know, if you were turning on um, you know, particular channel, it's like walking into a restaurant. You're expecting a certain menu of what, you know, what might be on offer at this, at this place. Um, and if you order a certain dish, you kind of have a preconceived notion of what that's going to be. And even if you would like the other thing, you know, it's it's one of those things where you buy something in a package at the store and the package on the outside, you know, I say this to writers, says that this makes brownies and then you make it and it's gravy, then like you instantly dislike this, even though I like gravy, but not if I was thinking I'm going to make brownies, right? Like right. that's. Now I have a problem. So that's the same idea with, you know, with with food of um, of meeting the audience where they're at. 
which is like really the idea is meeting your audience where they're at. I think that's a, you know, a perfect analogy and it makes sense. Uh, Cause I think back to the, to if you think about any television show that you like, you know, they set the expectation of, of what it was going to be. I, can't, I couldn't think of a single example where I was expecting X and I got Y. Right. If there was a blend, like you said, uh, and there's plenty of those too. But even in the beginning, you, you knew that it was a blend of X and Y. Um, right. And that setting tone, which is the other big thing you have to accomplish in act one, whether it's a movie or a or a show, is to set the tone, is to set up what is the genre and what is, you know, what kind of tone are we are we expecting here? So that by the end of, of act one, you have a fairly decent idea of what it is that you're going to be watching, not where the story is going. Right. right. That doesn't mean that I need to know the you know, whatever, who the killer is or whether the couple are going to end up together. No, no, no. But I need to have a sense of what it is that I'm going to be watching. What right. story am I going to be watching? And, um, I, yeah, I think there are some, you know, the, the, the all of the, the movies that are done well, um, they accomplish that. And all the t- TV shows that are done well, I think they accomplish that. Yeah. I wonder Um, what the arguments against could be, because I'm having a hard time imagining how you argue that you don't need an inciting incident or you don't need to show it. Like, that seems to me, I I just, you know, I can see arguments on the other side of a lot of things, but here it's really, it really feels like I'm not sure what, I don't know what the other options are, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, what what would be the other choices? Now, I... Because again, this is a, a specific point. So um, I'm going to stay on this for just another minute or two because uh, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Now, the when I was having this discussion, um, what was offered to me, uh, you know, I asked a question. Um, I asked it to um, our, my, the Stage 32 writers group I belong to. Uh, and I said, can you think of a show where the inciting incident wasn't shown? And someone said, dead to me. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with... Um, I'm very familiar, and the inciting incident is very much shown. Are you see, thinking they the would inciting say, incident is the killing of the husband? Because that's not the inciting incident. See, that's what I learned from you. Yes, yes. That's what I learned from you. Usually when you think that the inciting incident is not shown, no, you have the wrong inciting right. incident. You just now misidentified the inciting incident. Right. What starts the story is those two women meeting because the entire show is about their relationship, right? Right. Uh, the you know what I mean the beginning of the story the reason we're starting the show today instead of yesterday right is because this is the day that they meet and this is the day that they start to set their new goals about what that relationship is going to be about right, right. And, and the group that they're joining and and all of that it has an unmistakable right on screen you know clear as day inciting incident I could use that as a demonstration of how to do an inciting incident if I <laughs> if I needed to. I'm like, wow, that's a really good one. (laughs) That's where I can demonstrate that. No, the inciting incident is not anything that happened to the character before we began, right, Um, is backstory. Right. Many things have happened to the character before we began. It could be her, you know, when you think about it, okay, it's her husband's death. But then couldn't you argue, if we're arguing that things that are, that you know, that were then, you know, that that could be the inciting incident are things that happened before we began. Then could it be her wedding that could be the inciting incident? <laughs> you see what I mean? Or her birth, I suppose. You see what I mean? Like, how far back are you willing to go in order to find this? And the answer is, how about no far back at all? How about we don't go back? How about everything that happens before that inciting incident is backstory or what we call really anything that's before before we begin the, the show, before we begin the pilot, we call backstory. And anything that happens between when we begin the pilot and the inciting incident is what we call status quo. Mm-hmm. It's the way the world is before we begin. And it's important to kind of set a status quo before you have an inciting incident so that the audience kind of can locate themselves. Where are we and who are these people? And then you can start launching your story. Right. Like another. Um show that I just watched that I, I think <clears throat> I could you could see the you know the the setup very clearly 
was The Gentleman. It was another Netflix show. Um, uh, is on my list, but I haven't actually seen because I've been watching other stuff. But you could see the stat. I mean, there I could really pick it out. You could see uh, yeah. the status quo. And you could see, you know, when the main character's father dies, that's his inciting incident. Because now he has to take over the estate and then he learns that his father has been involved in some things that he never knew that his father was involved in. I won't spoil it for you. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, but it's, it, you know, I there I could clearly see it um, and it was well done. But OK, thank you. That, that's I hope people out there listening, especially if you're if you're writers, um, you know, this is an important, uh, you know, but that I, and I want to thank you because you taught me well, because that was my first thought when they said dead to me. I'm like, no, I think you have the wrong inciting incident. You have the wrong inciting incident. Yeah, that's, that's your <laughs> That problem. wasn't really the you inciting have, incident. You have misidentified the inciting. You yes. can look for the inciting incident. Once you know it's there, um, then look for it, because sometimes um, writers sort of bury it in the middle of a scene. And um, and they have every right to do that. And maybe that's their style, that all of these sorts of landmark moments are buried in the middle of scenes. So Marvelous Mrs. Maisel does that. And right. their exciting incident is buried in the middle of a scene. I mean, the show kind of stops to highlight it, um, which is when she, if you're familiar with it, she realizes that her husband is hack for all intents and purposes <laughs> that he's not an actual stand-up comedian but just copying other you know someone else's regime and that really like shatters her whole worldview right and and everything goes forward from there because she her new goal is to change him to make him into uh you know a real you know comedian which then of course goes haywire and i won't spoil the rest <laughs> right so but that moment is in mid-scene so if you are maybe looking for I don't know if you're not getting the style of the show, then you might miss that moment, I suppose. But if you're looking for it, then I'm sure you would you would realize, oh, wait, yes, that's where this, our story begins. Right. Well, OK, so now I wanted to pivot to another topic. Um, and this topic is is very much uh, I, I had not planned to talk about this so much this on um, this season of, of the podcast, but um from the almost from the very beginning um you know it keeps coming up it's on a lot of people's mind um and that's the subject of ai and um you know the impact and i had a, an online forum not too long ago where i got some panelists together and i thought we had a great discussion on the impact of ai um i have to say so i've attended two panels um that were kind of influential to me um, but I wanted to get your thoughts on what are your concerns about AI um, and its impact on the entertainment, or do you have any concerns about AI uh, and its impact on the entertainment industry? I mean, there's the present and the future in terms of AI. And by the way, you may know more about this than I do, because on the other hand, I have not attended panels. So, um, you know, I have read things and I've read you know, a lot of articles and a lot of screenwriter, you know, showrunners takes on this and the WGA's take on this and have, you know, had discussions with people, including people who work on AI, because my um, my brother actually teaches uh, uh, using AI. He's um, a computer scientist who works on natural language understanding, which is basically what AI is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in this sense, what we're talking about, this sort of AI, right? right. So um, that's where my knowledge comes from. And I mean, in terms of the present, the situation is kind of pretty simple. Um, in terms of the future, I hesitate because I am i don't have a crystal ball uh, and neither does anyone else really. But in terms of the present, there's really three things that are going on. Um, one is that at the moment, AI absolutely sucks at storytelling. It's really terrible at it. Um, so at the at the moment, the danger is more theoretical than real. Um, it's more about our fears than it is about the present, because um, because as right now, AI written stuff is easy to recognize because it's so bad. And um, which is fine for, you know, for certain things, I guess. Um, and I mean, I myself have used AI writing for I had to write a letter of recommendation for someone. And I was like, you know what? I just want like a template. I'll plug in my own things. But can ChatGPT just write me, you know, a generic thing mm -hmm. that I can then edit and modify? By the way, that was super helpful. 
Um, cause it's like, they're all the same, you know, right. that's not creative writing, but in terms of creative writing, it's terrible. So it's not taking anyone's job at the moment in terms of, in terms of screenwriting. Right. The second thing is though, that people are looking at what it could do in the future and what its implications are. And the WGA's contract obviously was a lot about that. And, um, the WGA succeeded in basically create, you know, having the studios agree to the idea that AI generated content is not um, essentially is not usable. It cannot be substituted for creator um, for human created content um, that, you know, it cannot, you know, it cannot be used. You can't do um, a, a show and have an AI um, create it and then ask a writer to like redo it. If a writer uses AI at home as a software and then they write something and the AI's input is not recognizable, then of course we'll never know, right? Um, but you can't have, you know, an AI take a writer's job for all of it. I mean, there's details to it, but that's kind of the bottom line. And the reason this, you, you might ask why the studios would agree to such a thing, because it seems like a really big victory, right, to, to <laughs> win that concession. But the studios agreed for one simple reason, which is that our industry relies on a bedrock principle that's been around since the, I think, the 1700s called copyright. Copyright is the idea that the law protects intellectual property, not just physical, tangible property like your car, but property in terms of ideas. And it, this really actually, I think, comes out of like the Enlightenment where, you know, the idea was to encourage people to have new ideas, right, to invent things and have new ideas. And that's why copyright and then trademark were created in the first place. Um, if you don't have copyright, then you can't own anything, right? Like the whole idea of owning intellectual property, the only way you own it, the only way it's in fact property at all is if you have copyright. Right. So the courts have ruled that AI generated content because it essentially strips copyright away from human generated content and just blends it. Right. Because it's essentially by its very nature, a violation of copyright that AI generated content cannot be copyrighted. If you cannot copyright something, then it has zero value. Then its dollar value is none, right? Because remember, copyright is why you own something in the first place, right? So when the studios were confronted with the idea that they could have AI-generated content, except that then they don't own anything, then it's not valuable, right? So you're now selling something that's worthless for and hoping that people will pay money for it, um, then that falls apart, right? Now you can't use that because... You know, because your competitor could equally use the exact same thing and you would have no protection against them copying you. Right. Because what you're right. using is a copy in the first place. So that drove the studios to basically cave and say, yeah, whatever. You know what? This is worthless anyway. Screw this. Um, in terms of the future, I mean, there are huge concerns about AI. Um, and what it could do to education and what it, you know, in the future, you know, if it acquires sentience and, you know, and all of that, like you can read all about like what the future could hold in terms of AI. And it's that future that legislators in the EU and now in the US are trying to find guardrails around um, is what it could be in the future. And, and I think those are much bigger conversations. And those are conversations around who we are as human beings and what we value. Like those are umbrella conversations, right? I was talking with an executive at, I think, Tubi, who told who was telling me with great enthusiasm, and he comes out of like the Wall Street world, um, that at some point, all human writing and storytelling will be obsolete and can be turned over to a machine. And no child will ever need to learn how to write. That the idea of putting letters on paper is, is going to be, you know, that AI can write poetry, love letters, you know, you name it, right? Novels, TV shows, but not just, you know, creative writing, but mm -hmm. imagine all writing, right? So that, I mean, to me, that's like we've been as the human race storytelling since cave paintings. Right. So, you know, writing is one of the things that is a hallmark of the fact that we are intelligent at animals, right? Um, that's what separates us from other animals. I don't know. I don't know how we retain our humanity and hand that over to a machine, but that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> so, well, that's I a will, bigger conversation that your panel can take on. So, <laughs> I know. will. I will. I will round out the conversation about. I saw um, 
an internet meme, if you will. Uh, I saw it on Instagram. It was a poster, a picture, I should say, of a man holding up a poster. Um, and the subject, it was, he was talking about AI. And he was saying, um, AI does not have childhood trauma. That's I instantly, <laughs> I well, instantly not that understood. Like <laughs> I, I instantly understood what he meant. And, and, you know, our human experiences informs what we write. Yeah. And if you take away those human experiences, then you take away the heart of our writing. I mean, there's another, I, you know, I neglected to mention this, but at, again, in the present day, right? Like not worrying about what's going to happen in however many years you want to worry about. In the present day, honestly, it's not your story that sells. It's you who sells. Okay. When we are buying a property, we're buying the right or not the, not the actual project. Um, and, uh, we're writing, we're buying your expertise, we're buying your point of view, we're buying your ability to tell a story. That's what the actual purchase is, right? Is you the human being, not the specific story. Your specific story can be rewritten, can be altered, can be all sorts of things. But particularly in television, we're we're buying you. Um, if you don't exist, then again, not what is what are we buying again? So people are like, well, you know, um it, it's that's the issue, is that. You know, I'm an independent producer. In theory, I suppose I could ask AI to write me a script and then I could try to sell that. Except what am I supposed to tell people? The script fell out of the sky and landed in my backyard. You see what I mean? Like right. that's or am I supposed to tell people that I wrote it, even though I'm not a writer and everyone knows that. So but setting that aside, I would need to justify why I wrote this, why I am the right person to tell this story. And that's right. going to be really difficult when I'm not the one who wrote it in the first place. This is what, by the way, makes it difficult for people to actually steal your work. When your work is very unique to you, when you're the only one who can tell this story, then stealing it is very hard because I can't steal who you are, right? I mean, you know, Greg Jenkins is an individual. I can't like, you know, really steal your identity in this sense. You know what I mean? So I can't steal your voice if it's unique. So it's in the same way, um, it's very like right now, that's the other reasons the studios caved is they know that they're trying to write, trying to buy human talent. And that doesn't exist. There's no, again, they're trying to buy your childhood trauma, I guess is my point. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's for sale is your childhood trauma. And since the AI doesn't have childhood trauma, there's no property there to buy. So right. that's where we end, right? So, I mean, I think that's a that's a, a good way to look at it. And um, the only the only other thing that I will add where I do see. So we just wrapped on a short film um, that we did. We did it yesterday, actually um, did a, hopefully all of our principal photography. Congratulations. Which I have to do some work on the sound, but I kind of knew that. Um, and I'm going to be using. So since I had this panel, you know, I was very as as a person, as a writer, you know, I was like, I heard this and I was like, yeah, I know, I don't, I, you know, yes, don't want that. But AI definitely, you know, uh, we had some people and, and that's why I was very fortunate to have a panel, but it was a panel of creatives who are using AI. And the panel that I attended before that really kind of reset the thinking. It's like, if AI is a tool, if you're trying to use it to replace humans, that will not be that won't work. But if you are trying to use it to look, can an AI assemble a short film out of what you've shot as a as a first assembly? Sure. I'm sure yeah. that it can do that. But after that, the creative choices are, are going to have to be yours because I'm pretty sure the AI is going to make terrible creative choices. <laughs> yes. So. What I'm using it for, and there's no question that I would not be able to do do the same um, is for the visual effects. Oh, yeah. And what, what is beautiful about AI, we've gotten to the place now is before, if I wanted to do what I'm, what I'm doing with this short film, I would have needed to have a facility that had a pretty good green screen. I don't need a green screen anymore. Um, right. You know, the, the technology has advanced where I can remove any background and replace it with it. Not only can I I can generate video from an image, from a single image, I can generate video. 
I can change camera angles on that video as if it was shot with a camera. I swear, I said, some people would tell me that. I'm like, can you please show me what it is you're doing? Because I'm trying to use AI to do some very simple, to me, very simple, creative, um, you know, generating visuals, right? The sort of thing that you would hire a, um, an artist to do, right? An right. artist rendering. And I can't for the life of me get the AI to give me something that I can actually use, right? Everything that the AI has done is complete. Like I can't, you know what I mean? It looks terrible. So, or just not at all what I was after. And that's right. probably because the visual I'm trying to generate I is both an imaginary thing and something that should be photorealistic um, because it's something that did exist, but before photography, um, and I know how it should look, and it should look real. If I'm trying to generate, you know, a half unicorn, half man, sure, I'm pretty, since that never existed and doesn't, and it's an imaginary thing, I'm sure, you know, Mid Journey could do a fabulous job. But if you are trying to generate something that's supposed to be photo real, then that's really, you know, or that's supposed to feel real, then that becomes really difficult. I'm working with a writer and we're trying to find character images for our pitch Bible. And mm -hmm. she pulled some that she pulled from shows and movies, which is how we usually find these. And then she had then AI generate some as well. And I could pick out which ones are AI and which ones are real in like without trying, like that was instantaneous. And the AI ones looked awful, which is why I could pick them out. So, <laughs> you know, they just didn't look like real people, even like no one would be fooled. So I was like, well, this thing of, you know, let's use AI is like, well, OK, but it would need to get better than this. I don't know. People who are happy, you know, like you are. I, I'm like, can you show me what it is you're doing that looks good? Because I'm, you know, because I'm I'm not up enough with the software to know how to do it. I think that's the issue. Well, I'm probably I'm I'm literally I'm using better the same software level. probably to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the same level as you in that I I've literally only started in the last week uh, of doing this. And yes. There is learning how to do the text prompt if you're using text to image generate. But the one thing I had, I was, you know, I was blessed to meet an actual visual effects supervisor who uses this technology. Right. right. And one of the, the first thing, you know, it's not one thing. You know, he uses mid journey. He uses runway. He uses Photoshop. Right. It's a blend of all of those all things. Of these, right. But you notice you hired an expert, right? Like that, <laughs> you know, you notice. You well, didn't I didn't him. hire him, but he you did, hired he him. But like, you know what I mean? You notice that you didn't replace him. All you did is handed him some better tools. Exactly. Exactly. And then that's really what started to change. By the, we're not, you're not going to. So the people who paint mats, you know, we're still going to need mats. It's just that the tools that they use to do it will change. Will, will change. I mean, for this like image that I'm trying to generate, I have a friend who's a graphic designer and who, who does this kind of thing. And she's like, well, you know, I can't do it right now for free, but like I could do what you're asking me to do. And I was like, well, are you going to use AI as part of it? And she's like, well, yeah, but I'm also going to use other tools. And, you know, that, you know, I'm going to use my own creativity and my own imagination and a bunch of other tools besides the AI. So like, she's still necessary, right? Like I can't right. just bypass or using the AI because like I said I can't like tell the AI what I want and have it presto appear out of thin air yeah like I'll give you a perfect example and, um, and then we'll move on to our last question I, I, I a perfect example so in this film it is about uh two female bounty hunters who is a short film um who get into an argument when one of them doesn't share a bounty that they recently um get and so there's a sword fight in there. Now, in that sword fight, um, I want the, uh, so I'm going to make these swords, you know, uh, these swords, rather, um, there's going to be a special visual effects and I'm using AI to generate that. Now, I don't want it to look like a lightsaber. I know right. it's a shame. It's really a, a katana sword, a sword. Um, and I, don't want, I, I, unfortunately, my, it's imprinted in my brain. The lightsaber is my frame of reference, but I want to try to come up with something different. different. Now, yeah. thus far, AI has failed miserably. 
<laughs> you do realize it has no imagination, right? All it does is takes what's already on the internet and recycles it, right? Right. So it, there's not like a, that's the that's the thing is it's very very easy for us to fall for. I think it's called the Turing effect, right? Yeah. Where you where you imagine that the other side of this equation that your AI is a sentient being, like a human, and it's very hard to remember that there's no such thing on the other end of this, right? No. That, yeah, so it doesn't. I think creativity and imagination—that's not going to happen, right? And it it tries it it tries its own version depending upon your settings, you know, of how strict you want it to be to your prompt or how create. But when it when I you know put it on, let it do its own thing, it, I come up with just things that don't even look humans. A human, you know, like the the arms are not where they should be <laughs> on. A, and I'm like, I just wanted you to change the sword, not, not the arm of the person, but yeah. all, so these are all the things that, I, but I, I, I believe I know what I, the approach that I'm going to take is I need to design somehow the look of the um, effect, but I need to do it probably in a different tool. And um, then what AI is good at, once I have that design now with runway because I can take that image and put it in runway and say, now I want you to use this as your guideline. Now it has something. Yes, that, that it's actually pretty good at is there are a number of applications that people have used where you give it the, the exclusive library of stuff to pull from and right. then tell it not to pull anything from outside of that. Like don't right. use the internet, just use my data, my stuff. And then that becomes a little bit, you know, that, that becomes more manageable and it's better at that. Yes. Doing that. So that um, that's, that's I'll, that's, I'll let you know how it how it turns out. How it out. turns out. I'm curious. I'll tell you that the um the showrunner of um Black Mirror asked the AI to write a new episode of Black Mirror. And but if you've ever seen Black Mirror, it's very episodic. Each episode stands on its own. So it's not like you need to know the journey of a character or anything like that, right? So you would right. think that this is something AI could do really well. And he read the script that AI generated, because it did generate a script, and he said that it felt like Somebody who had watched every episode of Black Mirror and taken bits and pieces of actions and dialogue and just st stitched it together in a kind of meaningless jumble, right? right? Where it lacked any sort of like meaning, you know, behind it. And it's like, this is, you know, he said you actually get got a very clear demonstration of what the AI is doing behind the scenes, because what came out is precisely what you would think would come out, out of the process that it's using. Right. It was not a usable episode of Black Mirror. <laughs> so that is a show I haven't had a chance to watch it because, as you well know, when you're trying to make television, you don't often have time. It's very to difficult to, yeah, it's very disturbing. That's all I can say to you, and then you can go forth from that. But it's a, a show that you can dip in and out of because it's, it's completely each episode is on its own is its own thing. It's an anthology, an episodic anthology. So, like, imagine each episode is like its own tiny movie. So you can watch the episodes in any order you want, whenever you feel like it. It's kind of great in that sense. So the last thing that I want to get into um, is this, this changing, our changing landscape of how content is, is delivered. And this sort of impacts my company because we are, you know, my vision is I want to, you know, I'm going to be creating this content and it, it definitely impacts the financing, as you may, may, may be familiar with. But where I anticipate this landing um, has effect on how much money I can raise. Right. But what I don't want to do is be beholden to, if no one else, I've done enough, or at least I believe I've done enough, testing on my side, meaning I had a web series. The web series was not well produced. It was, it was but... The audience reaction was what I, my belief is what I don't want is indifference. If people are indifferent about it, then that's a show right. that has no yeah. legs and nothing. I got strong act reaction one way or the other right. on this show. And I said, okay, now that's something I can build on. And based off of that, that's my belief that I'm going to go forward. 
But there are certain things that I'm not going to do that I know that industry stands like. I feel very strongly about the cast that I want to use, but it's going to make it, I will acknowledge, it's going to make it very difficult to do the financing of it. And But what I need to show is what, what is my distribution plan? Because I also want to distrib- distribute it myself. What is my distribution plan? And I don't want to be locked out because if no one buys it and I can't show it anywhere, then it, it has no value. So there are these things now, and I say all this as a segue is, so now we've got the evolution of fast channels and AVOD coming around where it allows, it gives people like myself another option of where we can put our content. Can you give us like a short primer on what fast I'm channels sure. AVOD are? And what's your view of, uh, you know, what's the future of those those two new things? Absolutely. Um, well, both of them are here already, um, and um, they're very much in use now. Uh, and their future is probably just growth. Um, but they and Avod has been around now for for some time, actually, and so has Fast in reality. Um, but people are maybe talking about it more. So let me just give you a, a super quick primer. Um, television uh, essentially started out as an ad-supported media, meaning that um, what financed uh, the shows was selling advertising, right? This was broadcast channels. I'm sure people still remember, you know, NBC, CBS. The idea is that they sell advertising, um, which is what finances the, the show. And then we came up with what we call SVOD, subscription um subscription supported video on demand okay the s is subscription and this is netflix right you pay a subscription fee there are no ads right Right. and um and you can watch whatever you want to watch whenever you want to watch it that's what video on demand means okay um so avod takes those two things and kind of blends them into a, a new way Uh, of financing things. Um, It blends sort of the best of both worlds. It's advertised, advertising supported, ad supported video on demand. So the A now, you know, replaces the S as opposed to a subscription fee. Now you have ads, right? The truth is that right now, AVOD is using as essentially just a lower tier of subscription. So you still have a subscription fee, but it's very small. And then, you know, and then you have short ads. So it kind of makes a little blend. Um, And this is Peacock. And this is, you know, um, uh, the advertising, you know, that you see on Hulu. If you subscribe to a lower tier of Hulu, there are now um, going to be lower tiers of Max and Netflix even. um, And there are lower tiers of Amazon where you watch ads in exchange for not paying such a big subscription. Right. And there's, you know, there are more of these networks that are going to be popping up, a lot more of them. Um, This, in a sense, is the replacement for what we had as cable TV. As you know, pretty much, you know, a lot of us have cord cut, right? We no longer have cable TV. But those cable channels filled both a creative niche, right, between the broad range of broadcast and the narrow niche of streaming was the was cable, right? So there's both a creative tier there and also a financial tier there. And so AVOD, I mean, to look at Peacock, which is, I think, or Paramount Plus, you know, those are all AVOD channels. The idea is that there are ads, but you can watch a show whenever you please. It's video on demand, right? Um, these are already starting to become successful um, since they are using essentially the exact same financing model as broadcast uses. It's a proven, you know, model that we all know about. And, you know, and at the same time, it's using the delivery avenue of video on demand. This is really combining two things that have existed and have been successful to create something else. Right. And so its future is probably really bright and is going to be growing and growing, um, which is why Max and Netflix and all of these other people are jumping into the AVOD space. Um, People are actually um, very 
tolerant of ads, believe it or not. Um, if you are a little bit older and have gotten very used to SVOD, to the subscription tier of Netflix, then the ads might bother you. But one of the things that you will, that I notice, okay, with even my, you know, son and just younger people is that particularly when the ads are little short films of their own, right? When they are mm -hmm. entertaining, they are actually very tolerant of ads. Um, they don't mind sitting through those ads, especially when the ad break is only one minute, which is usually what it is like on Peacock, and yeah. when the ads are entertaining. So the advertisers have gotten better, more sophisticated at producing tiny shorts, right? Those bite-sized, you know, half minute or one minute movies that just feel like an interstitial inside another show, right? right. So this is working really well. Um, Fast is um, sort of another version of this. Um, Fast is really an industry term. Um, it's not a term that you, your viewers would be familiar with, um, but it's free ad-supported streaming television. Um, so unlike AVOD, that still gets a small subscription fee, here the channel is completely free to you. There are ads. There are obviously more ads and they're longer because now only the ads are supporting it. But the only difference from, you know, from broadcast to that is that this is streaming on, you know, on a streaming platform. Um, it is not video on demand any more than CBS would be, right? It it just streams and you get to join the stream and there's a TV guide like, you know, where you can see what's on which channel and tune in whenever you want. Um, if you have a Roku TV, for example, like I do, then you probably have a tab at the top that says live TV. That's fast channels. Um, fast channels are available on Pluto, on Tubi, on Samsung devices, on Roku devices. Devices, um, on a number of other, on Freebie, which is Amazon's um, mm -hmm. version, um, on a number of different platforms. And each platform has its own channels. And some channels appear on more than one platform, right? Um, and I, I, there are approximately now about 1,500 fast channels. So if wow. you thought that there's very few, in fact, there are about 1,500 distinct fast channels. The fast channels mostly air for I, I don't know why we still use that term I guess I should say stream but I'm used to saying air um a lot of news programming if you think back to like headline news if you're old enough like me to remember cable right endless news um they will deliver sports that's endless sports right so there's like a tennis channel it's wall-to-wall -wall tennis right um and then they deliver, there are some that are like a crime channel, like imagine the old Ion on cable, where it's mm -hmm. crime shows wall to wall. It could be crime that's 80s crime. So now these are all 80s crime shows, right? And then there's what we call single IP channels, which is like the whole channel is law and order. OK, because there are enough Law and Order episodes to fill a whole channel. They just run sure. through all the seasons and then start over again. Right. Right. So. Um, really, really simple, right? So these are kind of the content that you're seeing now. Some of these channels, particularly Roku, for example, are starting to try to do some originals where they're producing shows specifically for Fast. Um, the problem is that right now, and I just attended a panel on this and spoke with the head of Amazon's Freebie about originals. And she was saying that the problem is that the ad dollars, those advertisers are putting most of their ad dollars into CBS and NBC and into ads on Peacock and Paramount Plus, right? Into AVOD and into traditional broadcast. But slowly but surely, their advertising dollars are going to come to the fast channels, which will allow them to have more revenue to produce more and more originals. So that's one trend with fast. Um, and the other trend with, with fast is also that in order to the infrastructure to start up your fast channel, your fast channel, okay? OK, um, is uh, the investment to do that on a technological level and have it carried um, is two to three million dollars. That may sound like a lot of money to some of your viewers and, and listeners. But in reality, if you are someone who raises financing like you, then you realize that two to three million dollars is actually not that much right. to get a, you know, a venture capitalist to invest up to them. That's like not a whole lot of investment. Right. And now you have your entire channel to fill 24-7, air whatever you please, right? 
And now all you have to do is get viewers to tune in and get advertisers to give you ad dollars to run ads. And if you have good content, then, you know, outstanding content, original content, will the viewers come? Will the advertisers come? Probably, right? If you build it, but the entry fee for coming into the space is lower than it's ever been, right? You do not need to be Disney. You do not need to be Amazon. You don't need to be Jeff Bezos to get a channel on the air. And that is a whole new idea, right? That you can build your own distribution platform that goes out, you know, not only nationally, but internationally. Fast channels are available around the globe in, you know, many, you know, in those kinds of places. And that is a really new, new thing. And like I said, right now, fast is kind of, you know, it's both big and small, depending on your point of view. <laughs> um, but it is definitely growing. That's a very, you know, this is what if there is a replacement for broadcast, which I'm very dubious of because the death of broadcast have been forecast for 25 years and it hasn't happened yet. But mm -hmm. if there is a, a replacement for broadcast, it is certainly fast when you think about it, right? Because this is exactly the model of broadcast, except streaming instead of airwaves, right? Right. So that's the only thing they've replaced. Um, and, and one of the nice things for viewers is not only that each content is fragmented into channels, but that the, the channel surfing is done in the same way as your as you've expected, any kind of TV guide, right? Where the channels are listed and, right. you know, that, that kind of way. One of the new things about that also is AI. So the idea is that there's an AI algorithm. Um, if you've ever watched Netflix, for example, you notice that the order that the shows are presented to you or what are the things that you should watch, um, Netflix's algorithm recommends things to you based on what you've seen, watched right. in the past. So things don't appear in random order. They are appearing in the order that they might be appealing to you. Right now, the fast channels are like in alphabetical order or whatever random order. And if you are, you know, if you subscribe to Pluto and you have, you know, 500 fast channels to choose from, this can become really unwieldy. It's hard to discover right. new channels, right? So they're working on AI that would do the same thing for fast channels as what it's, you know, done for Netflix, for example, where when you turn on the fast channel menu, it recommends to you which channels you may wish to watch. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Based on right. what you watched in the past. And here's a new channel, you know, you've been watching the Law & Order channel, you know, endlessly that we've noticed. So now we have started up a CSI channel. Perhaps you would be interested in that, right? Or we have, you know, uh, uh, you know, our own news channel. And here's now a different kind of news channel. Maybe, you know, you'd be interested in that. So, you know what I mean? That these right. are, you know, this is the kind of thing. And so when AI drives this, then you can get a lot more revenue because it's a lot more targeted. And especially a younger generation is wanting targeted content, right? Because right. on their phones and all of that, all of the content is, is you know, very much micro-targeted to what you want, Right. So that's a big, that's the next big revolution that's coming in in fast channels. But if you've never checked it out, um, you know, it usually will show up as the live TV icon. And uh, and if your mom is telling you that many people think that this is just live TV, they think that they're watching broadcast television. They can't see the difference. And, right. you know, if your mom, like my mom, is telling you that she watched this or that show on Netflix and you're like, that's not on Netflix, chances are she's watching it on a fast channel so yeah. without realizing that that's not what Netflix is. So, you know. Well, I mean, this, and for people like me, you know, that's, that's the hope of the future. What, of, uh, you know. Yeah, I know. When I said you three million, like you sort of lit up a, wait a minute, hang on. That's not an unreachable amount of money. Yeah, I can, you know, I, I, I think I can hit that number. I, I've got to, you know, well, um, I, not to make some news here, but, you know, we, we we're talking about there's there's things that we're we're at a stage now. There's things that we want to do in our in our company, and trust me, those things are worth. Are we have to raise a lot more than two or three million dollars? So two or three million sounds pretty sweet to me right now. Um, so, 
but yeah. it's not an idea of, of I need to be Disney in order to participate in the marketplace, right? Which exactly. for most independent, you know, studios, for example, is not a tenable, like that's not a thing, yeah. you know what I mean? So then you can only be a content creator, you can't be your own distributor. Right. And many smaller companies are getting into the distribution game. And many of the people who are distributing fast channels, you've never heard of. So they may be distributing 20, 30, 100 fast channels, which is not a lot, right? When you are thinking about 1,500 total, you know, channels. So, So, you know, and that's, I think that there's a lot of, um, now hopefully what the end result is is that will be uh, more opportunities for diverse creatives. Um, That's what I'm focused on. That's what I want, because I think there's still a lot of stories out there that, you know, haven't been explored. And, oh, yeah. um, and I think that would do well. And I think people would be surprised because when I meet other diverse creatives, they all tell me the same thing. I think we all have this, this idea of like who would be watching, but who watches like the biggest part of the, back when you can get data by race, because before GPDR, you could get that on Facebook. Um, the who, my largest audience even though in my show there wasn't a single white male, my largest audience were white males over the age of 65. Now, for my content, you might not think that that would be a natural, you know, um, outcome of the content to it, but that's who our largest viewers were. And it kind of pokes at that myth, well, what will people watch? You know, people are people. You know, if you give them something, an interesting story, something that they haven't, you know, quite seen before or it catches on to their attention um and they will watch and you know that that's the whole premise of of why i'm doing what i'm gonna do it there's lots of stories out there that i think are compelling that we want to try to put out there and you know as they all say nobody knows nothing i I can't tell you if they're going to be a hit or not but i know i want to try to put it out there and you know see you know i i believe that there's a a strong possibility that these these projects would you know do well in the right i mean the industry is growing in that direction and the industry is growing internationally right Um, people who are talking about the contraction of Hollywood, um, they're talking about the contraction of like the prestige television, right? The, the you know, the Netflixes and, and Amazons and Hulus of the world um, in terms of them reducing their budget. But that doesn't mean television is contracting overall. Um, you know, I think I saw a headline the other day that, you know, that television is dead or something like that. I'm like, really? Um, television is growing in certain, you know, and my production company focuses on the area as where I feel television is growing uh, because that's what makes business sense to me, which is why I focus on, you know, international projects because we're definitely growing exponentially internationally. Um, By the way, fast channels are growing exponentially internationally. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, and, you know, and then also, you know, content that features the voices of people who haven't been heard before, emerging voices, and tell stories that we haven't seen told before. And that's very difficult to achieve unless you get creatives into the industry who haven't participated before, right? So we have traditionally been excluded from participation. That, to me, that's how you get new stories is bringing new participants into into the business. Well, this has been... A real treat for me um, having this conversation. I I appreciate your time. And um, just quickly, I wanted you to know that, um, you know, a lot of times people do things and don't realize the impact that they have on people. Um, You you are having an impact out there. Um, I am not the only one of your former students that's on the verge of doing. uh, I don't want to make news for that person as well but you have another student <laughs> oh you gotta like if you're one of my um one of my students or even just someone who has seen a webinar and you're having some success would well, please email me so because i really want to know about those stories like if one of your listeners like if you had news let me know please right i really want to hear about people's success stories and you know that's always you know, like keep in touch. I don't know. People are like so hesitant to get in touch when I'm actually really easy to get in touch with. So like, look and at how can people you meet you? You know, if you have my email address, for God's sake, email me. So, you know, like, let me know. 
how how should people reach you if they want to uh, if they want to keep deep in touch? Um, there's really like uh, I mean, there's really like three easy ways to reach me. I guess um, you can certainly um, reach out to me on stage 32. I'm on stage 32. You can just yeah. you know follow or friend me, or I can't remember what that thing is. Connect <laughs> me on stage 32. Yeah. Please just connect. Um, so you can connect with me and then send me a message on stage 32. That's super easy. If you're not on stage 32, you really should be. Um, and um, it's free, by the way, to create a profile. Um, and there's an enormous education library that you can, you know, take advantage of. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, and, you know, connect with me there and send me a message there. Again, if you're not on LinkedIn, you probably should be. Uh, LinkedIn yeah. is having a revival, a big resurgence as the platform it was intended to be, which is for work. For a while, LinkedIn was taken over by political and whatever junk, and now it's coming back as as it was intended. Yeah. Um I also have a website, which is uh, for my consulting business, which is AnnaHenryConsulting.com. It's pretty easy. Um, and uh, you can send me a message through that as well, and that'll come to my email. So um, those are- Okay, well, there you have it. And I'll put those ways. links, <laughs> I'll put those links in um, our podcast episode so people know how if they uh, will reach you. But you you are having an impact for sure. Uh, you're you. You're- classes, your teachings. Um, uh, I definitely, uh, because I, you know, I took your lap, it has, um, you know, set me on the path that, you know, it, it was like a clarifying uh, moment. It was my inciting incident. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I will make a, 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 if it's okay with you, a quick yeah. pitch for stage 32 only because um, there's not like, you can't get free stuff, but here you can get free stuff. Um, so uh, on stage 32, Netflix sponsored a series of extended webinars that are like three hours long, each of them on a variety of topics. And they really did this for their own, um, this is Netflix global for their own like global creative community. In other words, to send it out to the people internationally that they're working with for places where there are no film schools. These are free. Netflix paid for them. Um, so you can consume them without paying on stage 32. Um, the Actually, the second one technically, but the first one in their series of five, um, I did. They um, they commissioned me to do it. And that is on pilot structure because we started this entire podcast with structure. Um, yeah. And that is me teaching three hours worth of how, you know, pilot structures work um so you can if you uh, can stand watching me for three hours explain to you how to structure a pilot then you can do that free of charge on stage 32 i by the way get zero money it's i don't i don't get residuals i just get my name out there but as of a year ago i was told that it had been downloaded like a quarter million times which is terrifying yeah. <laughs> well, I, I personally and and people who are listeners and or watchers of this podcast know I'm not going to bring anything to you that I don't, you know, anything or anyone to you that I don't personally um, you know, have confidence in. And, and I can tell you that um, the knowledge that I, I, I knew nothing <laughs> when I say nothing of television <laughs> prior to start, it started me on the path. Um, I took two master classes, which kind of started me. But then I took, you know, Anna Henry's lap. Um, and, and I think that was the first lab that you did for stage 32. This was no, that. I'm sure it was not because I've been doing, I've been teaching for them for about eight years now. Oh, eight years. Okay. So, wasn't yeah, the first I've been teaching. I'm one of their very first educators. When I first came on board with stage 32, um, the founder RB, I think was running it from his basement. So um, the platform has more than a million users. I think we had like five. Um, no, not really. We had a few hundred, <laughs> but like it was brand new. You know, right. so, um, you know, when I first came on board. So, um, well, yeah. I, I can swear by, uh, you know, especially if there, you know, if there are free courses out there and you, you, you get the benefit of, you know, Anna's knowledge um, and you can do so for free. Take advantage of it. Okay. I, I talk about stage 32. I'm sure my, my, my audience is sick of me because everything that, you know, I I have been able to glean and has set me on the right path. I got through stage 32. I will give them their props on that. Um, it really has opened up 
access to the industry so that you can learn. And if you're serious about your craft, then you you have to educate yourself. You right. have to learn the tools. You have to. And but the other thing that that you know I really haven't well not to the extent that stage thirty two does it. Once you you get comfortable and and there I belong to a Thursday night group. Every Thursday night we meet and we practice pitching. That's absolutely all we that's awesome. Yeah, seek out writers groups for sure. And and these are the people in that group. They are getting stuff produced. You know, uh, and we've got all levels. We've got people who are new, and now we have people who are produced writers um, that that have movies that are coming out that you will see. Um, that have, you know, I, I don't know if they're A-listers or not, but they're they're well-known actors that are attached uh, to those scripts. So we've got we've got bona fide success in our, in our group. And, and you'll find it all over stage one too, of writers who are, and what I was starting to say is that one of the, the nice things about stage 32 is you have the opportunity to pitch to executives. They have these. Oh, yeah, that's sessions. one of the many things. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> most of those sessions are, you know, really affordable. Where, when are you going to get an opportunity? You spent your whole time trying to get the attention of somebody. And now you can come to a place and say, hey, but before you do that, don't do what I did. I didn't take anything, um, any kind of class on pitching. Um, I just, they give you like this handout, but the handout is really nuts. You had like anything, yeah, you, know, like, you got to practice it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I didn't really understand how to, especially, um, pitching a television show, you know, you're not pitching, Very different from pitching, you're pitching the movie. pilot. And, yeah. um, you know, I tried to pitch the series. Yeah. You only get like five minutes. <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about the whole series in five minutes. The focus should be on your pilot episode. Cause that's what you're selling. If you're trying to. No, just, no, don't do that. Uh, don't pitch okay. your pilot in five minutes. Imagine me trying to follow a complicated story in five minutes. I think I'll like lose my, I'll be like, wait, what? <laughs> um, don't do that. <laughs> so um, if you were pitching your TV series in five minutes, um, pitch the overall concept of the show and then pitch your characters um, and pitch a little bit about like how your seasons would unfold. Um, really pitch the whole show. Don't pitch any one story. Now you may be pitching as you're describing what your whole show is about. You probably will pitch the inciting incident, like the premise of the whole thing, right? right. Which is probably a tiny piece of your pilot when you think about it. But if you are trying to tell a story in five minutes, you're going to be telling it incredibly quickly and the person will not follow you. But also what they won't get is, no, really, what is the show about? Who are these characters at their core? And what is the longevity of the show? And really, those are the three things they're trying to get out of that pitch. If you convey those three things, that's really what you what you want to spend your time on. And then a little bit of an intro about yourself and your personal right. connection, because again, it is you who we are selling. Um, so I'm like shaking my head going, please don't do that. Um, <laughs> that's not, it's a much more effective um way and the way we pitch in the professional world is exactly that it's personal connection here's what the show is about um you know here are our characters me about here's what the show is about in terms of character the who what when where why right, right. who is this about where does it take place you know and when what is the world here and you know what are these characters going to be doing in the show how does the show unfold in its structure what is its central conflict and then here are the characters who are the main characters and what's entertaining and interesting about them um and then we really want to pitch the seasons like how the show can keep going unless you have a mini series where you obviously you would be pitching right. the mini series as a whole um and we we tend actually to not pitch the pilot very much or very briefly as only the first piece of the first season um in part because the person could just read your pilot right like that mm -hmm. would be faster so um you know isn't that what you want so we're kind of trying to get a sense of the whole show 
Um, whereas with a movie, you really do want to pitch the movie because it's right. not like there's anything else to pitch, right? right? So with a movie, you really do want to pitch out the story of the movie in broad strokes, not like every twist and turn. So right. that's sort of my brief advice on, you know, on pitching television. So it actually becomes much easier to pitch a whole show in five minutes if you keep this in mind, if you're not trying to tell a story from, you know, beginning, middle and end, like in minute detail. Hmm. Scene to scene to scene, at which point you will just run out of time. Right. Guaranteed. Well, we, we, even in, in our group, we, we will call that a beat trap. You know, when you're pitching scene to scene, um, you're discouraged from that. But so that, wow, this is a uh, yeah, much we'll, better. Practice this. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll and, have and, to come back, audience. Uh, yeah, I can. I can. Um, I can um, yeah. And I taught about pitching. I do pitch labs and I taught about I have webinars on stage 32 on pitching, although many other people do, too. Um, just make like if you're learning about pitching, it is different for TV versus movies, as I'm just saying. So when someone is, t- is teaching you pitching, like you know, just be a little careful, like, what are you watching, right? Like, what are they teaching you to pitch? Right, which, so, right, what means? Um, you know, yeah, pitch? exactly. And and then um, a written pitch as well, like how to construct a pitch Bible and, you know, and and all of that, because there's definitely, um, you know, webinars and things on there. There's there's tons of, uh, it's being called, Stage 32 has been called the Netflix of education, of film industry education, partly because they just have so much content. Like there's right. just enormous amounts of, of content on, on there. There's tons of webinars and those are relatively inexpensive. But like I said, the, the free ones are in many ways the best. The Netflix webinars, look for them. Um, and and those are free. And, and to some extent, those are those are the best. And there's one on pitching that's done by Chris Mack, who's a vice president at Netflix. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. <laughs> one imagines. He does. So, <laughs> yes, definitely. And uh, again, it's been a real treat. You, you've you've dropped so many, you know, pearls of wisdom <laughs> uh, on myself and the audience. Uh, thank you uh, for Absolutely. your time. And, uh, My pleasure. You. Um, and uh, definitely I'll keep in touch and hopefully there are members out there who are, if you, uh, if you haven't taken one of Anna's courses or if you do, then you go on to have to let her know that, Hey, you know, um, here's the success I was able to have. It makes a difference. Um, when oh, yeah. people know, you know, Hey, I do, uh, I'm doing this for something. That makes my day. Like, please, yes. can you make my day by telling me that your successes? So. Absolutely. So you have been listening to our interview with the one and only and fabulous Anna Henry. Um, It was a real pleasure, real treat. Thank you for coming by today. And I will leave um, my audience today saying bye-bye for now. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Thank you.